Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming through. I know it's very, very hot out there. Um, pretty gross. Thank you to the cabinet for being here. I appreciate you guys. We're all assembled. I just, Selena signed your legislation, so you're official. So now you have an official full cabinet, which is very exciting. Um, got some other directors and deputies from the city team, city council president Bill King, controller Murray, uh, Frank, our city clerk. Um, welcome to the press. Thanks you guys for coming and to members of the public. Um, note that in the interest of time, we will not take questions after this. Uh, I'll give some remarks and then each of the cabinet members will give a brief presentation to update you on what our priorities are, what our efforts are, uh, and some of our successes here in the city of late. Uh, so for me, being mayor means many things. It means constantly pulling over while driving to take photos of street signs that need replacing or basins that need cleaning. It means driving your husband crazy as you point out plans for a new traffic pattern on your drive home from a restaurant. He loves that. It means bracing yourself for bad news when there's fireworks or a snowstorm. It means uh, attending more funerals than anyone should have to and sending far too many sympathy cards. But being mayor also means that you get to meet the business owners who applied for grants and who we've cut checks to, some recently, thanks to the American Rescue Plan, in the six figures. It's about hearing how those funds have helped them take their business to the next level. It also means watching new playground equipment go up right now as we speak at Novembrino and at the North Scranton Little League, and the excitement of the kids who are gonna get to enjoy those upgrades. It means getting to swear in new police officers and firefighters and personally congratulate their families, their proud parents, their infants a lot of times. It means listening to residents and to community organizations and searching for ways to fulfill their needs and as often as possible successfully doing so and seeing the recognition that their government is actually, yes, really, here to help and work to fix their issues. Being mayor means assembling the most capable team possible to fulfill the wide range of responsibilities that a city bears. So I'm honored to be standing here with our administration's cabinet, again, official as of about an hour ago, with our last member seated, some of whom have served in their capacity for years and others who are just coming on board. Each of these professionals that you're here from today brings dedication, passion, and expertise, not just to their role, but to our senior team. I'm proud of how we've broken down silos across our government and continue to work with each other through fostering relationships, making organizational cha changes, and adding technology tools. Working for the city of Scranton in 2023 has a different feel than it did before. We have an increasingly diverse workforce that is helping us to better serve our whole community. We've partnered with professional firms that are elevating us to new levels of planning, execution, and services. We've partnered with community, nonprofit, business, and healthcare organizations to better or understand the needs of our residents, connect them to services, and plan for success. Every day, our goal is to improve quality of life and safety in every neighborhood in Scranton and position our city as a destination for investment, industry, good jobs, and new residents, as a place that the kids who have left want to come back to. It's an incredible place to raise a family. I think I know that personally. We have to work to make sure that option is available to our current residents and families looking for a fresh start. We're working our strategic economic development plan. We're building upon our equity plan, which we just wrapped up, and soon we'll have a climate action plan to complete that three-legged stool. Our team assembled here, our directors in the audience, our city council members, the people throughout this building, through our other city offices. We know that the residents of Scranton deserve high quality services, deserve to be treated fairly, deserve to be treated without favor or stigma, deserve to have the optimism and the positive outlook about their future. It's our job to show people that government can work for them, to help them understand they deserve good things, to help them have a positive attitude and outlook for their city, to be proud of where they call home, and to believe that their future is bright. Each of our cabinet members will give a brief presentation, as I said, but before that, I wanted to emphasize some of the efforts that uh, I'm most proud of. But broadly, I think there's been a reputational shift about Scranton as viewed from the outside. Uh, the news got a little buried a couple weeks ago. We had uh, air quality that was the, the, high, the worst we've seen, I think perhaps ever. Something also the same day happened uh, that was very big news that just trumped everything. 
Um, but we got a credit rating upgrade from the S&P. This is a huge deal. It's an enormous deal and it's something that we will continue to tout and talk about and be excited about. Uh, it's thanks to hard work over years of administrations, different professionals that came before us and folks like our solicitor Jessica Eskra, who's been here for the long haul, our finance director Matt Dominas, who was involved in this for the last 30 years since we began in Act 47. Um, it's a tribute to all the work that we've been able to do with our city council, with our controller, to improve our internal controls, to put together policies like our, our debt fund policy, our, our, our debt balance, our balance policy, fund balance policy, sorry, uh, our investment policy. Without those pieces, with, without that, we would not have gotten this credit rating. This new credit rating is a really big deal. It's going to help us cut costs when we go to market to borrow, for example, for our annual TRAN. And it broadly means that people trust us, the market trusts us to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. So we'll keep talking about that, but it has real material impact on our budget, and it should be something that the city of Scranton residents should be proud of. Uh, we're seeing increasing dialogue and interest from investors who are looking to Scranton, wanting to be here, wanting to see if they should relocate or expand their businesses here. Uh, we think that this train might really happen. We'll see in October, but we really need to be ready for that. That's something we've got to prepare for. So with, with any good news, of course, comes a lot of hard work. We've got to pr prepare for that, especially in our housing market. And there's a whole whole thing, host of things that we're doing on the housing front, which uh, some of our folks will go into more. But it's a really, really exciting time, and people get that. There's an energy around Scranton. People know Scranton. We're part of national and state organizations, and we're getting, um, we're getting recognition for that. The Pennsylvania Downtown Center Conference was here just last week. The Pennsylvania Municipal League is going to be hosting their conference here uh, next year. I know this year I've gone to the Radisson and the Hilton almost every week to greet some sort of statewide conference. I've done the, the county treasurers, the county veterans affairs directors all came. So people are coming to Scranton, right? You start to see this trend, which is really exciting. Uh, we'll be hosting the um, Mayor's Innovation Project next month, just about a month away. So national mayors from all over will be talking, deep diving into policy on uh, climate, on housing, on fiscal transparency, on a host of things. But you know, they chose us. They chose Scranton as a highlight. So it's really important that we talk about these things too, right? The Aspen Institute has given a grant to our NEPA Thrives initiative that we have going on with the Scranton Area Foundation and other community partners. It's a big deal to get an Aspen grant. Um, we got recognition at the recent U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, annual meeting for the work that we're doing with our rescue plan for our small businesses. Uh, we just are one of only three lead cities in the country on the White House challenge to end hunger. So there's all these things that are happening you know, with and around us. People are cheering us on throughout the state and throughout the nation, and we should all be proud of that. On our overall economy, we've seen uh, business starts tick up. That's a trend that happened during the, the pandemic, right? People left their jobs or were you know, laid off. They decided to start a business. That can, trend has continued in Lackawanna County. It's continued in Scranton. And we have had the immense privilege of being able to use those rescue plan dollars uh, which you know are possible through President Biden and his legislation uh, to give money to businesses to help them start existing businesses, help them expand. We've been hearing stories from all sorts of business owners throughout the city. We were just at Poppy's Kitchen in Southside last week where they were able to take their business to the next level. They're going to be able to buy a food cart and go to different festivals. That's going to boost their business incredibly. Uh, we were at the um, the the incubator just a few weeks ago with Senator Casey, and there were three different businesses that we highlighted, all three technology companies that attribute their recent success and their recent ability to, to amp up and even launch their app to our uh, grants that we were able to get through the rescue plan. So we're, we're really materially helping people, uh, and it feels really good, and those have real economic impact. We've seen a sustained increase in our earned income tax. We've seen our real estate transfer tax continue to, to be churning and holding those are good indicators of the economy moving in the right direction and my my favorite stat is our brewery index which is just something i made up but um we have four new breweries here in the last few years uh to me and being you know a gal from oregon breweries really are an indicator of vitality they mean that people have disposable income they're usually an indication that families are looking for something to do in the evenings or on the weekends We've got these four new breweries and hopefully we'll be able to bring more. Uh, so that's that's probably the most fun one uh, in terms of the economic indicators. 
In addition, we have really worked hard, and I have to thank Tom Oleski, who's in the audience, uh, as well as our le legal team. We have been cutting red tape. Uh, Council has been tremendous in working on uh, this with us. Just since last October, we have slashed permit fees. This just a couple of weeks ago, we passed through city council slashing permit fees up to 70%, whether it's a, somebody trying to put on a new deck in their house or whether it's somebody looking to build a, a substantial building downtown. Those permit fees, cutting those, is really, really going to help us drive that development that we need to see, especially as you know, I, I believe we're on the cusp of a lot of investment. We want to make sure that the the fees match what they should be and also that our processes are good. So again, with city council's help through these last you know six months or so, we've streamlined the licensing process. Last fall, we cut out archaic procedures that had all these hurdles that, that didn't mean anything. You had to get a notary for every single recommendation from every contractor you've ever worked for. We didn't need that. We were able to cut those with, with maintaining our high standards on our contracting. We also put permits and licensing, licensing online in 2020, we've continued that, we've continued to improve that process and we're seeing that. We know that, that a homeowner that's looking to do a new bathroom or, or a, a developer that's looking to do something, they don't necessarily work 8.30 to 4, right? We need to make sure that we're a 24-hour business in that. Uh, and Eileen will talk a little bit more about that. And then I just again signed, um, I know Council, we've kept you busy the last couple of weeks, uh, just today signed our Sidewalk Cafe and Parklet program. This was something we did during COVID, but it was really important that we extended this out, uh, that you're able to expand your footprint into the sidewalks and onto those public spaces during the warm weather months, be able to uh, increase the, the business and the traffic to your business and generally in, in our downtown areas and in our corridors. Um, and now there's just a $25 processing fee. So we wanted to keep that simple. We wanted to make that easy. We want it to be uh, a process that business owners don't find onerous. No, we had a lot of talk a couple weeks ago about our walkability study. Um, so just generally health and safety, you know, obviously a huge focus of any city, certainly a huge focus of, of us here in Scranton. So you know, we're looking to do a lot of work on safer streets. That walkability study is a big part of that. And the walkability study is unlocking our ability to apply for a big grant, uh, which I think it's due on Monday. That, we, that would be the grant that would help us rebuild Lackawanna Avenue. So. These studies, I, you know, I know people hear the word study and sometimes like, oh, another study. Well, the, doing the study helps us plan for success. It also helps us get the money to be able to do the programs. Um, you know, we're working on the street signs. We're working on a Vision Zero campaign, looking for grants to increase awareness about speeding, about bike safety, more and more improvements on our roads. And you've seen a lot of traffic pattern changes coming through. Riley Associates has been an incredible partner to work with on these. Uh, I just signed, I think, gosh, four or five of them today that, that council passed. Those are tremendously important for the city. They're tremendously important for those neighbors that are on these intersections that uh, see lots of different crashes. So we're trying to we're trying to get there. Right now it's piecemeal. We're hoping that we can get some grant funding over time that we're able to do a, a really comprehensive study of all the intersections. Uh, on the public health front, um, Dr. Rachna Saxena has been incredible to have on the team. She's been doing wellness at your doorstep and health fairs throughout the city. Um, she's the, the go-to when, say, something surprises us like an air quality issue. She's who we look to to make sure that we're tracking that and seeing what changes we might to, need to make uh, for our employees and, and also what we need to say to the public to help people understand what's going on. Um, we have a Boosted Hunger Task Force meeting this month. Like I said, we're part of a White House challenge on hunger. We're increasing mental health care access for our first responders. We have a new Lead Safe Scranton initiative. That's very exciting. We've, we'll be working uh, with EPA on that to see where we, need, where we need to replace lead paint. And then as time goes on, we're looking to do a lead pipe initiative. Uh, Dr. Saxena has hydration stations coming soon. Those have been an initiative. And we have a heat desert study coming as well. Uh, on a hot day like this, it's some really important that we, we think about those things. There's a lot of people out there that don't have um, you know, access to air conditioning, access to water. We need to make sure we're doing all we can to help them. On the climate resiliency front, we're part of the Penn State Local Policy Lab Resiliency Cohort. Just another example, I think of the, the people outside of Scranton wanting to work with Scranton, right? Penn State wants to work with us. 
I was just with the Penn State Sustainability Officer last week and she knew all about our study and everything that, that we were doing. It was really exciting. We have our Climate Action Plan, RFP, is live on our website right now, so we're looking forward to starting that. Uh, I think everyone in this room has probably seen our code enforcement electric vehicles out and about. I always get very excited when I see them. Uh, yesterday when I saw someone driving, he was wearing his vest, so I was very happy talking about safety. Um, <laughs> We're applying for chargers, electric vehicle charging stations. It's a joint grant to the federal government, uh, an effort with our Northeastern Pennsylvania mayor's group. Um, we have a new environmental, environmental advisory council, uh, and with them, we will be working with the EPA and DEP to talk more and more about envir environmental justice. That's something that we'll be talking about and in including not just our EAC and, and the, the DEP and the EPA, and what will include experts, academics, Dunmore, for example, other neighboring boroughs uh, and towns that we should, you know, just like stormwater, you know, environmental justice issues don't end at the city border. Um, and on speaking of stormwater, I'll let Eileen expand more on that project, our many, our many stormwater projects. Uh, a couple more things on the arts and culture front. We've been uh, convening quarterly meeting, meetings with arts leaders to identify ways that we can better support them. Um, our team has been highlighting you know, arts events and cultural events through our social media. Uh, there's new art installations for City Hall that we're planning for this fall in concert with our school district and other schools. Uh, I'm very excited about, we have a new Latino fiesta in August at Nayog Park. So talking about the way that, that we can foster this environment that everyone belongs and everybody has a positive attitude. We're seeing more people want to start festivals and start different events uh, in addition to the great ones that already exist. So I, I see that as a really positive sign. Um, and I don't want to steal uh, Scott Gassenmeyer's thunder on parks, so I will try not to do that, but I'm just so excited about the parks. I'm going to talk about a few of the projects. <laughs> um, so all over the city we have, you know, projects for the parks that you guys are well aware of. Like I said, there's Novembrino is going up right now, the, the new play structure. Um, there's a new structure at the North Scranton Little League, which is a city prop property. Um, Tom Oleski has been instrumental in pushing that forward to get that going. Uh, we also have uh, the mini park at Market Street near our fire station that's going to be done this summer uh, and other work going on at Connors Park. Planned for the next year uh, is Kapaus, Robinson, Oakmont, and then we've got Weston Park, Connell, Nayog Pickleball Courts and Butterfly Court, Billy Barrett, Grace Park, and then Weston Field. We, we're just we're doing work on parks all over. We've got our Nayog, Desi Nayog Pool Design RFP bids back, and we're looking at those. We'll be working um, with City Council on that. So there's just a lot of great stuff going on um, and very much focused on recreation and our kids. Uh, in addition, I think that you guys have seen this, but it's something, again, to really emphasize that our partnership with the Scranton School District, Valley in Motion, and the Trust for Public Land on these schoolyard transformations is a really amazing example of what we can all do together when we partner. Building that new playground at JFK is taking all of these entities working together. Again, American Rescue Plan funds. This wouldn't be possible from our standpoint without the American Rescue Plan and without that landmark legislation that the president passed and also gave directly to us, right? You, I know you've all heard me say it a lot of times. We fought very hard to get the funds directly. We are able to deploy these funds, whether it's a facade grant in Providence or a, you know, a startup grant for a different app downtown or these, um, these, different, these different things that are tailored to our schoolyards. Like that's happening right now because we got the funds directly and we're directing that ourselves. Um, these funds, if they were sitting at the state and we were having to go get them, would probably not be on the street and we probably wouldn't be uh, working with these awesome kids at Kennedy yet on these projects. So it's really important. So I could go on all afternoon, as you guys know, but I will turn it over to Eileen and uh, we'll make our way through the cabinet. Thank you, Mary, and good afternoon, everybody. That was quite quite a list, and it's really extraordinary what's been accomplished during uh, Mayor Cognetti's administration to date. So hats off to the mayor and everybody on this illustrious team that we have here with us today. So I've started out the year, and last year, as the director of uh, co um, community development. And I, I too want to uh, compliment Tom and his staff, because the, a lot of the work that we've done has approved efficiency, 
effectiveness and how we do business with the public and how we treat the public and uh, treat them as good customers in the city. Um, in addition to reducing the paperwork around licensing, the mayor talked a lot about uh, our open gov system and how we're using that to better serve uh, residents. That allows residents to use our systems 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They could print their permits online, they could pay for their permits. This was a fundamental shift in how we did business. Because when I first took over the role, one of the most common questions I heard was, how long is it going to take to get my building permit? Well, now we know the answer to that. Last year, 91% of the permits were completed in uh, less than 15 days, which is the, the uh, obligatory standard of, for licensing in, in the Commonwealth. This year, we're down to, they were up to 95% are completed within 15 days. That's really, really important for contractors and for residents to be able to move forward with their projects. So, you know, hats off on that piece to Tom. Also, we've improved our licensing program with the help of city council updating our ordinance, the help of new software. Uh, we've been able to identify over a thousand properties that were previously not licensed in the city of Scranton in a very short period of time. So we've known for a long time that there were properties that were not licensed. Now we could identify them and we could get them licensed and work with these owners to help reduce blight throughout the city. So in May, I took over the role as the business administrator in the city. And that group too has made significant strides to improve business processes. So in the past, the city would generally take out a tax anticipation note of over $12 million. Last year, we were able to reduce that to $10 million. This year, we reduced it to $4.9 million. And with the help of strong earned income tax returns so far this year, we've actually paid it off earlier than anticipated and saved the city a significant amount of interest expense. This year, the city has contracted with a brand new auditing firm with the goal of having the audit completed in early fall of, of this year. We've also updated our procurement process. We've made it online, we've made it transparent, we've made it easy for vendors to use and it's been a very effective tool. And thanks to, to controller John Murray, who's a very big, big part of making that work every other day that we have a procurement go off. Um, also revenues, thanks to our team upstairs and, and Open Gov and the transformation we've done there, we have uh, right now 56% of our projected revenue overall has been collected prior to, to um, Jan or the end of June. Right now, 79% of refuse fees are in for this year. Our code enforcement team with between building permits and licenses are tracking at 89% of their budget already prior to the end of June. Over in our HR department, we've published our employee handbook. We've implemented monthly educational training for our employees. We now have a fully staffed department so we can better serve all of our employees. We've implemented supplemental life insurance and FSA for full-time employees. And in the fourth quarter of this year, we will implement an employee evaluation system um, throughout the city. Our IT department has been extremely busy. We support our city's website, which saw over 173,000 visitors since January 1, accessing information from event, upcoming events to information about permits. They manage our city's ERP system, and we've digitized critical city business systems and processed in real time almost $700,000 worth of licensing and permit fees. They've completed upgrades to citywide, citywide to ensure that outdated and potentially unsecure hardware was removed from the city and managed the city's infrastructure which supports over 400 employees across all the departments. They've hardened our digital security measures citywide to eliminate the potential weakness for sharing documents and implementing new processes to transfer documents in a more secure manner. They've supported the police department's mission by providing updated technology for detectives, provided updated mobile communication tools for patrol use, and maintained technology within police vehicles. And they've supported over 200 plus network cameras throughout the city. They've deployed a citywide internet to enhance communication across departments, provided a library of training resources, and to better, and better allow us to access important city documents. They've implemented a process for city-owned technology use, the onboarding and offboarding of team members, and completed the implementation of as inventory assets. Our Treasury Department has managed over 3,000 customer service calls to date this year with nearly 1,000 in-person consultations. They manage 18 Act 98 properties that are in escrow due to fire damage, and they've processed 36 exonerations. 
Now into our city grants. I, I'm really proud to say that since 2020, when th this administration started, the city's been awarded $20.8 million in grant funding for various city projects. This ex is exclusive of ARPA funding. Projects include uh, funding for city hall restoration, $11 million for parks improvements throughout the city. And we've managed to leverage that with American Rescue Plan dollars. So overall, we have 15 projects that we will be undertaking in the next few years across citywide. In addition to parks funding, the city has received over $5 million in grants for streetscaping projects. The city's also leveraged the American Rescue Plan dollars to have over 12 million available for these projects. The recently completed walkability study, as the mayor mentioned, will assist the city in evaluating transportation options downtown and help us to be effective and efficient in applying for additional grant funding. Over the next few, few years, the city will see Elm Street, North Main Street, West Lackawanna, Green Ridge Street, Cedar Ave, Parker Street, and Pittston Avenue bridge replacements. It's a really big deal for the city of Scranton. The city has budgeted $17 million in ARPA funding for stormwater improvements. They'll take place in East Mountain, Kaiser Valley, North Scranton, and other areas prone to street flooding. At the same time, we've aggressively applied for grants, again, leveraging American Rescue Plan plan funds so that we could affect any neighborhood and every neighborhood that's adversely impacted by stormwater throughout the city. I've talked about the ARPA uh, infrastructure projects, but some other projects that, that are really important that have helped businesses and individuals that were affected by the pandemic. As the mayor mentioned, we, we've invested significant dollars in business startups. We've invested $1.2 million and these businesses have been downtown. They're in West Scranton, they're in South Scranton, they're in Pine Brook. We've created jobs, we've redeveloped properties, and we've allowed businesses to expand their physical space and their dreams. To date, 19 businesses have been awarded a startup grant, and these have spurred economic growth throughout the city. As the mayor mentioned, five of these are tech startup grants. They also include event venues, revenues, and unique stores that help make Scranton wonderful. On the childcare and education side, in childcare, we've awarded $725,000 to build new classrooms, make employment opportunities, and to improve access to critical services for families. Supporting childcare does support our economic development in the city and allows for mobility for hardworking Scranton residents. Also funded was educational catch up. Nearly $775,000 has been funded to help children across the city catch up because we know how important education is and we want to help give every child in Scranton the opportunity to succeed. Wellness grants, $950,000 in wellness grants were awarded to support critical services experience, that experienced even greater impact during the pandemic. By providing the funding to prevent drug overdoses, address issues associated with behavioral health and community violence, offer aid to organizations that help with problems such as hunger and disease. All of these have been extremely impactful and you know, very well appreciated, especially for through our nonprofit organizations that we've been able to support uh, with a million dollars through our partners at, at SAF. We've also partnered with NeighborWorks, with ACE, with UNC. We're providing funding for first time home buyers, um, providing funding for home rehabilitation. We're providing funding to do lead remediation through houses without, throughout the city. All of these have, could have only been possible with the American Rescue Plan and our ability to leverage that funding that we received to apply for different funding through, the, through state grants and, and other federal grants. And lastly, I'll follow up with uh, one of the bigger initiatives that I, I, I think that we're undertaking right now is the Stormwater Authority formation. We've, we've identified seven potential partner municipalities around us, and we've reached out to all of those. We're working with those. We've met with their legal staff. We've met with their engineers. I've even gone to council meetings to talk to them about the importance of uh, stormwater authority and how that affects our MS4 rating and what we could do to work together to alleviate that problem. So thank you for your attention. I'll introduce Jess Eskra, our assistant city solicitor, our city solicitor. Sorry, demoting you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We'll let that pass. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with me, I've been with the city for eight years now, serving as the city solicitor. And for much of that time, for most of my legal career, the city has been bogged down with extensive litigation. 
I am very pleased to tell you all today that several legal successes have been achieved. Um, as you may all remember, much of the city's time while in distress status and its financial dysfunction was either precipitated by or exacerbated by lawsuits. For example, there was the failed commuter tax and the back pay award to police and fire unions. In more recent history, the city faced further legal challenges to significant portions of its revenue. This was necessary for continued operations on its financial road to recovery. After several years of diligent defense, I can now finally report that they have all been resolved. To recap, the city faced the Act 511 lawsuit, which in 2020, 2021, the city won on appeal to the Commonwealth Court, the legal challenge to its rental registration fees, which was favorably settled, the suit challenging the city's acceptance of proceeds from the sewer sale, which was favorably resolved as well, and two matters that are tentatively set to be resolved later this summer. That would be the class action challenging the city's rental or refuse fee and another class action regarding the city's collection on delinquent refuse accounts. The potential exposure of these suits was estimated to exceed $184 million, enough to potentially keep us in distress status for years to come or far worse. I'm honored to report today that these matters are all resolved or in the process of being resolved for under $4 million and monetary damages along with a maximum of 7.5 in declaratory relief. In total, this has spared the city exposure to over $170 million, a sum that would have been impossible for the city to financially bear on its way out of distress status. We've also been successful in defending against other litigation. We've had five long-standing federal lawsuits against the city dismissed and successfully resolved a number of others for figures that were reasonable, fair, and fiscally prudent on a carefully scrutinized case-by-case -case basis. To illustrate, the number of active suits from 2020 to present have been cut almost in half. The resolution of these legacy cases allows the city, and particularly its team of legal advocates, to turn its gaze from the past to the present and to the future, and to pivot from defense to offense. <coughs> Much of the success can be attributed to increased capacity within the law department with a well-cultivated complement of attorneys and assistance from specialized outside counsel, where prudent, dedicated to the city's best interests. We have four full-time solicitors, along with several part-time solicitors who all specialize in areas of expertise, from policy and legislation, to code enforcement, to tax, and to federally funded projects and initiatives, much of which uh, Eileen had mentioned. The benefits of this investment are already starting to become visible. We've seen a decrease in lawsuits filed against the city, allowing our team the space and capacity to shift our resources to proactively provide legal guidance to prevent new litigation so the mistakes of our past are not repeated. Additionally, it allows us to use our legal force to accomplish our forward-looking, resident-focused and business-focused legal initiatives and goals, including an update to internal policies and legislation, which we've already begun, as the mayor had outlined previously, as well as to use our legal resources to proactively advocate for citizens. For so long in the city's history, we were focused on cleaning up internal struggles that we had, financial dysfunction. Now we're finally in a place where we can dedicate more resources to serving our residents and, and businesses. Um, to that end, I'm pleased to report that my deputy solicitor, Andrew, Andrew Cotillo, um, who has a background from HUD in Washington, has been accepted into the Affirmative Leaders Fellowship. There, he'll join other municipal and state legal counsel to explore affirmative litigation on behalf of the constituents we serve. There will be a priority, prioritization on this effort with regard to environmental and housing issues. With these goals in mind, we look forward to continuing to represent the city of Scranton. Thank you.
Hi everyone, um, my name is Selena Andy Oppen, and as of officially an hour ago, <laughs> I'm the new redevelopment or the new executive director of economic and community development for the city of Scranton. Um, I, much like Eileen and Mayor, want to start off by thanking our code enforcement department, um, especially Tom Oleski uh, and our two managers, Robin Salemba and Andrew Sunday, who are not here with us, um, because they have been they have made great strides so far in the efficiency with our code enforcement department. To date, um, from January 1 to right now, we've had over a 79% increase in the amount of code enforcement inspections that we've been able to handle within the city. So from January 1 to right now, they've conducted uh, over 3,000 code enforcement inspections within the city, um, and we've approved, approved over 45 uh, certificate of occupancies for both new and redeveloped housing units as well as commercial properties within the city. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Saxena, our uh, public health coordinator. Um, I know the mayor talked about some of the public events that she's already um, attended and at these events she's handed out over 5,500 Narcan kits to residents of the community. One of the things that I'd love to highlight within the city of Scranton is that the city of Scranton has such a sense of community that I haven't seen at any of the other communities that I have I've lived in. Um, and along with that, a lot of it is a tribute to a lot of the nonprofits and a lot of the small businesses that we have within this community. Um, so I'm excited to be able to do a lot of work moving forward with them. Um, to date, we've had We've invested over $1.9 million in community revitalization projects. Um, over 280,000 of that went into blight remediation within the city. Um, we have over $920,000 of CDBG funding that's gone into our streetscape projects. Um, we partner with UNC to do our Pinebrook uh, front door project where we are replacing the doors within the Pinebrook community to help overall safety for the for the residents of that community. So we've allocated over $100,000 for that project. Uh, another great organization is NeighborWorks and the Beautiful Box program that we help administer with that. We've given them over $40,000 in funding. Um, and then to touch on some of the ARPA funding that we've gotten um, over $500,000 to move forward with the lead assessment and abatement uh, initiatives. Um, we also are doing a lot of work with the small businesses. Um, as of right now, we've invested over $36 million back into the community. Um, some of that goes towards the, the RACB. We've currently, we've currently allocated $34 million in RACBs. Um, LSAs, we've had $1.1 $1 million. Um, and our loan to grant program, to date, we've allocated $234 thousand dollars to local Scranton businesses. Um, we still have over eight hundred thousand dollars remaining that we want to look towards um, to allocating out to qualified businesses throughout the city of Scranton. Um, and then also our micro grant program, which Eileen originally already touched on. So moving forward, we're going to be starting to do local roundtables. Hopefully once a month, we're looking at structuring that right now so that we can provide information to all of the local businesses within Scranton um, to get give them more information on how to make sure that they're properly set up to grow their businesses. And then most importantly, letting them know about all of the available funding that we have so that they can start utilizing that as well. So, cause our goal is to not only to bring businesses to Scranton and then also keep and fund the businesses that are already here. We also have done a lot in terms of our housing initiatives. Um, so far, we've allocated over $1.4 million when it comes to um, the housing initiatives that we've already implemented. We're starting a work uh, a workers housing program with UNC, which will be over $100,000 that we are going to be providing to that program to provide affordable housing for workers um, within different organizations. Um, our home buyer assistance program, uh, we have about over $180,000 of CDBG funding um, and then another $350,000 from our ARPA funding that's going towards low income first time home buyers within the city of Scranton. Um, so to date, we've had over th just from last year with this program, um, we've been able to assist 30 low income residents buy homes within the city of Scranton. Um, and then we also have over $800,000 that we have allocated towards uh, the, from ARPA for our home repair program. Um, back in April of 2023, or of 2023 um, we've been working a lot with the Scranton Area Foundation as well as the Federal Reserve Bank out of Philadelphia to really look towards making 
effort, more efforts, faster efforts in terms of safer, affordable, more attainable housing throughout the city. Um, so in April of 2023, we had a housing lab um, with, again, in partnership with Scranton Area Foundation and the Reserve Bank. And the goal of this lab um, was to identify areas that we need to focus on that will allow us to move forward at a more rapid pace. Um, we invited regional stakeholders, regional banks, our partners at the Federal Reserve, and some of the key things that we focused on that we need to really um, start prioritizing is developing strategies around affordable housing development, identifying pathways to affordable home ownership within the city, um, develop a common understanding of the root causes of barriers for each area within, within housing development, um, and gain exposure to promising practices by engaging with experts and par practitioners in each focus area. And then we also want to make sure that this is an ongoing um, initiative because we want to commit to concrete steps to move forward with everything that we've already outlined. Um, so from April until June, we've engaged with some of the regional stakeholders and banking institutions. Um, so we reconvened in June um, to really identify what the barriers, are, what the problems are that are causing these barriers. Um, some of the major barriers that we've identified were um, obviously development of affordable and retainable rental housing in the city. Um, just as a whole, whether you're a local investor, whether you're a large investor, whether you're a first time home buyer, there is just a lack of um, a streamline to public funding. Um, there's a lot of red tape. So we're working on a lot of initiatives with the local banks um, to try to figure out how we're going to overcome a lot of these initiatives. Um, obviously, space and capacity. We have a huge lack of affordable site and land usage. So we have some um, things in place right now to help identify where we're able to identify where we're able to move forward with housing development within the city um, and then other things to come which we need to do a little bit more research on and again very thankful with our partners that we are working on with this is looking into housing costs and um, the lack of just knowledge when it comes to borrowing to be able to afford a house um, some of the things that we're doing is obviously uh, continuing our regional bank uh, engagement with the regional banks and the Federal Reserve Bank. We're moving forward with applying to the FHL Bank of Pittsburgh Blueprint Program. One of the great benefits of that program um, is to be able to train not only our staff, but also our community partners around building a strong local leadership and collaborating to when it comes to development capacity. And I know that we say this all the time, we don't need another study, but we need another study so that we can move forward with identifying specifically what the housing needs are in Scranton. There's a lot of assessments that have been done around the area, but there is nothing that exists specifically within the Scranton community to identify the specific problems that we have in this community when it comes to um, the lack of home, home ownership and affordable home ownership. So we are going to be putting out a housing needs assessment. Um, and the goal of that assessment is to hopefully um, identify some areas where we're able to improve with our, our programming, being able to better allocate funding, being able to better receive funding, and then identify partners that are just not at the table that we know we need to bring to the table so we can move forward with all of these initiatives. And then we have Scott Petrface from DPW. <laughs> Hello everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Scott Petroface. I'm the director of the Department of Public Works. Even though I've only been employed with the city for three years, I've only been the director here for four months. Uh, I'm sure you all know all the areas of responsibility for the Department of Public Works. We pick up your refuse and your recycling. We maintain your streets and your stormwater systems. We take care of your dangerous trees and your traffic lights. In other words, we are the face of public safety. It's a tall task, and it seems like the workload never seems to get smaller. We are on pace to exceed our 2022 results up here, so there's a few of them that I'd like to identify. Uh, our mechanics at, at the Department of Public Works have completed 238 work orders to date, and we document that in Cartograph, which is our computerized maintenance management system. This is a tall task considering there's two mechanics and 87 pieces of equipment. Our traffic department has already installed 516 street signs. We have 495 made, and we continue to address the street sign needs. We responded to 11 storm events between January and March. There was snow and ice 
Of those 11 events, we drove over 5,600 miles. We are currently awaiting two new plow trucks, which will bring our complement up to 18 so that we can better serve the city's needs. We have made a, 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 a point to start documenting and tracking all of the key factors within our, within our department and to utilize technology where and when we can. We try very hard to address each and every issue that we receive through the 311 system. I feel that we've made an impact and we will continue to be there for you. Thank you for your time and your support. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Gassmeyer. I'm the Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Scranton. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all. I'd like to start off by thanking everybody in the city for uh, supporting me and showing me the ropes along my learning process that has occurred here. But I feel like we have made strides in the short time I've been here. Uh, and I'm excited to keep going and see what we can do in the future. So in my short time here, uh, I've realized that the impact that these parks and green spaces in our city have on the lives of our, uh, <clears throat> of our citizens and our, their recreational capabilities are astounding. It's truly remarkable what our team manages to make happen in the city and to make every experience that an individual and a family has in our parks a memorable and enjoyable experience. Um, our department, just a brief overview, we have 10 parks employees uh, that take care of over 30 parks in the city as, as well as multiple sports and recreational areas. Um, we have other facilities that are more community centered based within these parks, such as Weston Park with our ARC camp that occurs there every day, uh, year for our residents with special needs, which is a fantastic foundation, as well as Weston Field, which is home to our Irish Boxing Club, uh, many sports projects such as basketball and soccer that give our youth uh, an opportunity to invest their time into something positive for them to uh, continue growing in the right direction for the future. Uh, we also have our pools and splash pad facilities, which are fantastic outlets for everybody in the city to utilize, for, especially in these hot summer months and days. Uh, our duties that we cover throughout the city, so our parks team works hard. Like I said, 10 employees, over 30 parks and multiple other areas. They seasonally will cut grass, pick up trash, upkeep maintenance of all these areas uh, in the summer months, as well as during the winter months in the slower periods, snow removal, maintenance and preparation for the coming year and all the events that these warmer months bring to our city. Um, and what I've re come to realize is that it's very personal for them. They're each assigned their own individual parks. It's something that I love about them is that they love and they care deeply about every individual area that they're responsible for. These uh, gentlemen create little projects for themselves to make each individual area more beautiful than when they found it. Uh, little things to improve the community around it. And as Selena stated, the tight-knit community bond within each individual community and the city as a whole really leads towards these gentlemen having the same uh, attitude towards their communities as the community members do themselves, whether it's in the Hill section or whether it's in North Scranton or any uh, neighborhood within our city. These guys put the time and the effort to make them their areas beautiful in order for our citizens to enjoy them and continue utilizing them in the most positive ways uh, that they would like to use them. Our department uh, has many community programs and partnerships that we are involved in. Uh, as was previously stated, Valley in Motion and TPL for the JFK Elementary School uh, Park and Playground that the students designed, which is fantastic. I, I love that that was one of the first things that I got to be involved with when I was here, just to see the smiles on their faces and just to see that the kids were really bought in to everything that they had planned and voted on. And uh, it, I can't wait to cut the ribbon on that place and see them running around and having fun with that. We also have the Youth Advocacy Program and Friends of the Poor uh, that we work with, <clears throat> as well as NeighborWorks. Um, our park projects currently, we have been blessed with the opportunity for these grant uh, opportunities with uh, ARPA, the American Rescue Plan, DCNR, as well as DCED through uh, our current projects as we've previously talked of, Nova Brino, North Scranton Mini Park, and Connors, which will be uh, completed soon. And we can be utilizing those areas for what they're designed and meant for, as well as the future phases. So the plans for the future and the way forward, uh, as the mayor mentioned, and Ms. Cipriani mentioned, uh, Kapalas, Robinson, and Oakmont in the future, uh, as well as Weston Park, Connell, Nayog, the pickleball courts, and the Butterfly Park, which I think is gonna be such a fantastic thing for our community. Um, 
and Billy Barrett. So these future projects are gonna add life to these spaces um, and these spaces are community hubs and will improve the recreational capabilities of our citizens and residents as well as just make our city even more beautiful than it already is. Um, there's a lot to be excited about now and in the future for the city and I am beyond proud to be a part of all the positive change that our city team is bringing about for everything. So thank you, I appreciate it, and uh, Chief Judge from Scranton Fires. Good afternoon. I was sitting listening to the other directors talk about their projects and I was looking around the room and, and I looked to see the seniority in this room. I think Scranton City seniority, I think it was Mike, then Chief Carroll, Mike from WNEP, then Chief <laughs> Carroll, then Todd, and then myself. And I thought about when I got hired here 21 years ago, it's a different vibe now. I can honestly say that 21 years ago, we wouldn't be talking about all the positive things that are occurring here in the city. So I'm happy to be a part of that. And I thank the mayor for letting me be a part of that. So just an update on the Scranton Fire Department. We entered 2023 fully staffed our budgeted number of 140 personnel, and we continue to operate at that strength. Department ended 2022 with 3,777 calls for service across the city. And as of today, before Solicitor Asker stood up, the department had answered 1,653 calls for service, so that would be 54. Um, on April 4, 2023, an arbitration panel issued an award between the City of Scranton Fire Department and IFF Local 60. That award provides stability for both the city and the firefighters through 2026 and gives us the ability to do proper planning for the city. Scranton Fire Department has been transitioning to a proactive model of delivering emergency services. Our goal is to evaluate a comprehensive community risk reduction strategy and implement those strategies to reduce risk across the entire community. Many of our programs are now focused on preventing emergencies from ever occurring. Scranton Fire Department is implementing these initiatives through education of the community, adopting industry best practices, and training for our members on new tactics within the fire service profession. Mark Twain said the secret of getting ahead is getting started. The Scranton Fire Department has begun this incredibly important work. Our smoke detector installation program has been a tremendous success. The department installed smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in 483 residences in 2022, of which 292 were in low to moderate income areas of the city. In 2023, we initiated a proactive blitz campaign on weekends in areas of the city. In June of 2023, we reached our goal of installing smoke and carbon monoxide detectors in 1,000 low to moderate income residential buildings across the city. This pro program was made possible through a FEMA Fire Prevention and Safety Grant. In 2022, the department entered into an agreement with the compliance engine to increase our compliances, compliance for businesses to provide their annual inspection and fire protection systems to the city of Scranton. And in less than a year, our annual inspection compliance has risen from under 60% to just over 90% compliance. The city was also awarded a grant to provide nationally recognized certification to our supervisors in 2022. In the first quarter of 2023, this training and subsequent certification was completed by our supervisors. Currently, 90%, 92% of our officers are now nationally certified under best practices in the fire service industry. The city received an increase in its ISO public protection classification rating from a class three to a class two municipality in 2022. This improvement was the direct result of partnerships between the city, the county, and the Pennsylvania American Water Company. Those partnerships continue, and as recently as last week, fire department officials met with the PA American Waters local leadership team to increase cooperation efforts. Our lofty goal is to become a class one municipality in the next rating cycle, which will be in 2026 or 2027. The future looks promising here in the city of Scranton, 
and the fire department is poised to continue on a pathway for true community risk reduction. Our 2023 projects include finishing our comprehensive EMS feasibility study, developing a five-year strategic plan, conducting an Engine 10 replacement assessment, and securing our partnership with the Career Technology Center of Lackawanna County to have a land use agreement in place and an engineering assessment conducted to begin the process of building that much needed training facility for police, fire, and EMS across the city. We will continue to leverage technology, foster internal and external partnerships, and look for opportunities in the forms of grants and new partnerships to make Scranton a safe place to live, work, visit, and enjoy. The Scranton Fire Department members stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, and the current dedicated men and women of the Scranton Fire De Department are committed to continuing the legacy of service and integrity. Thank you. Chief Carroll from the Scranton Police Department. Good afternoon, everyone. Thomas Carroll, Chief of Police, City of Scranton. I'm a 26-year veteran of the Scranton Police Department, and I have served as the Chief of Police for the past 18 months, which has been a distinct privilege of mine. In our efforts going forth, we are in the middle of our accreditation process. Hopefully, we will soon be accredited under Pennsylvania uh, as a professional law enforcement organization that has uh, all the best practices and policies going forward and truly a competitor for all law enforcement agencies in the state. Our current crime statistics are in line with previous years. It is not perfect. However, I'm very pleased at the efforts of our police department. For those who are interested in all of our statistics, you can get them on our website through a link. We uh, populate our statistics monthly through NIBRS, the National Incident-Based Reporting System. You can see it for yourself as it grows. Crime in the city of Scranton is influenced by elements external to Scranton. Understanding this, we have strengthened our partnerships with not only our internally with our community members and our community organizations, but with our federal, our state, and our local law enforcement partners. I want to address the regional global crime trends all over, not just wait for them to occur in the city of Scranton. But with those same partners, we do conduct investigations inside the city of Scranton and we maximize our efforts to reduce crime and prevent crime within the city of Scranton. We've additionally, we've partnered with the University of Scranton Center for Crime Prevention and Analysis to review all of our calls for service the past five years. We are looking for the trends in our reporting to help us better isolate areas of disorder and focus on those areas. Furthermore, it allows us to have a strategy to look forward and see where we want to go with our enforcement. It'll be intelligence-based prevention and enforcement strategy. Like all police departments, the city of Scranton Police Department is experiencing a staffing shortage. And we consistently operate uh, well below our, our mandated staffing. That is overall strength. We have the strength with, through the use of overtime. We have not neglected our obligations to the city of Scranton. And we maintain our high level of service. To do so, we had to modify our structure and balance our operational requirements. Uh, we meet all of our minimum staffing and compliance with all of our collective bargaining requirements. Our officers are truly our greatest asset. They have shown tremendous courage and strength during these challenging times. They're out there every day, 24 hours a day making sure Scranton, Pennsylvania remains a safe place to live. Some of the areas significant, which I will hit on a couple, I know it won't be all that you're interested in. However, these areas are brought to attention uh, frequently by members of the public. 
Traffic safety, abandoned vehicles reported. We've seen a decrease this past year of abandoned vehicles that were reported to the city, a 60% decrease. We have gotten more proficient and increased our removal rate of these vehicles. Traffic safety enforcement. We have conducted over 4,000 traffic stops in the name of public safety and traffic enforcement over the past year. And we've seen some considerable decreases of our uh, incidents related to traffic. Commercial vehicle enforcement. We increased our commercial vehicle enforcement by standing up a new unit and getting officers trained and equipped. We've increased that by 53%. Mental health. The Scranton Police Department last year responded to 600 calls for service for mental health incidents. We started a new partnership this year, our co-responder program. I'm happy to report that this is functioning as expected. And we not only want to extend this, but we'd like to see it expanded to cover more areas. They've assisted us with 45 incidents and it was highly successful. We've uh, implemented programs, not only for, we talk about mental health for our citizens, our response to these crises. We look at the resiliency of our own police officers doing this job every day. And we are implementing programs for them as well. We conduct critical incident stress debriefings for major violent incidents that occur to help them cope. We make availability of trauma counselors for those officers. We made recently, made, it's voluntary, mental health screenings available for officers. And we're in the final stage of selecting a, an application, looking for a vendor to provide officers, emergency service workers in general, to include the fire department as an outlet anonymously Maybe these dedicated professionals will speak to somebody to help ease their stress, make them more productive officers and family members. As the chief of police, I am dedicated to making sure that our officers are trained, equipped, and have all the tools they need to conduct this challenging job. We made considerable investments this year in professional development of our officers and our command staff, and that will increase over time. We have partnerships with Axon, recently signed. We have the state-of-the-art body-worn cameras, dash cameras in our vehicles, and we've upgraded our less lethal systems, the taser system, to its latest model. We've increased our fleet, reliable fleet. It's getting there. We're making the improvements needed by partnering with Enterprise, the Enterprise Fleet Rental Systems, where we can maximize the use of our dollars that we spend on our motor vehicles to get a more reliable fleet. And we've partnered with the National Testing Network, which we will see the results, or begin to see the results next week, as an online testing for recruiting police officers worldwide for the city of Scranton to encourage others to come here and streamline the process for becoming a police officer. Additionally, we spoke of uh, staffing shortages. We will be, there will be five um, applicants or candidates graduating from the Act 120 that the city of Scranton sponsored. We'll be hopefully swearing them in in July, at the end of July. All right, lastly, I wanna thank those who cooperate with our police department. We cannot be successful without public participation. We need people to report crimes. We need people to stand up and call 911. If you are challenged by that and are uncomfortable, we encourage you to at least use our anonymous tip line. You'll find that on our website. The more information we have, the better reporting we have, the more successful we can be. The takeaway for this, for the police department, is that the Scranton Police Department is strong. We are capable, we are dedicated to the safety of the city of Scranton. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Chief Carroll, for, for that reminder. We, we, it does take an entire community. We need your help. The police need your help in the form of those tips and those anonymous tips. Uh, we have the 311 hotline. We need, if you see a, you know, a catch basin that needs to be cleaned, let us know. Send us that address. We will get out there. Um, it's a big, big city. I drive it all the time. I, like I said, I pull over the side of the road. I take a picture. I send it to 311 myself. We need the we need that engagement with the city. We've seen a, a huge uh, a huge success with that. So we do have a system in place. We encourage folks to use it uh, and help us continue to to make the city stronger. Um, I I think you heard from the cabinet here that we we really work as one comprehensive unit. Of course, there's the fire department. There's the police department. There's you know, there's, there's things that they do, there's those, those responsibilities that they bear, but we work together as one organism, as one unit, and that's something that I'm very proud of. And I wanna also thank, not only, you know, we have city council, city controller, um, the, the city tax collector, we also have our federal um, colleagues in Senator Casey, Senator Fetterman, uh, Congressman Cartwright, who help us so much uh, in getting these initiatives and all these grant funds. Uh, also our, our state representatives who are incredibly helpful uh, in State Rep Donahue uh, and State Rep Kozarowski and Senator Flynn. Um, I also really wanna make sure that we thank uh, Tony Santoli, our city forester. He does so much and he still, yes, still is doing it as a volunteer. So I wanted to make sure to mention Tony and all of our members of boards, commissions and authorities. Um, it, they have, these are unpaid positions and they spend a lot of their time serving our city. So we're thankful to them. And also our neighborhood associations. Uh, a lot of neighborhood associations all across the city that are working hard to make the city better. Uh, again, they do it on a volunteer basis and we're grateful for that. So you know, we're, all, we're all working together to make Scranton safer, to improve life, quality of life in every neighborhood, but of course there's more work to do. Uh, we wanna lift up our residents, our nonprofit organizations, our businesses, our children as one Scranton. This is something that we, we came to you with last year with the, the rollout of the economic development plan. The one Scranton logo is something you see like when you go to Kapaus Park, I just took a picture yesterday. It's, we, we put that logo up there because we wanna make sure that people realize that we're trying to grow as one city. We don't wanna grow in two tracks of haves and have nots, of, of folks that you know, have, have our property owners and, and have everybody's got a job and everybody's doing okay versus the people that, that need a, a lift up and need a fair shot. So we wanna make sure that we're continuing to work together to achieve those heights that as a community we're embracing change, that we're envisioning, envisioning the possibilities of what can be, embodying that positivity. Sometimes we can get a little bogged down, and I think this is a national problem right now, we get a little bogged down in the negative. I want, I want us all to be positive. We've got so much going on in the city. We live in such a great place. We have so many people that come here. Eileen and I just had a meeting at 11 a.m. with a, a person who just came in recently as an executive from a place. She said to us, you know, I never would have thought that I would have been in Scranton. In fact, when the, the, person, the recruiter told me Scranton, I said, absolutely not. And then I came here and I loved it. That happens a lot, right? So it's all about our attitudes. If we believe it, we can achieve it, and we can't get bogged down by the past. We can't get bogged down by you know, folks who let us down in the past or a nostalgia that cripples us instead of leads us to success and progress. We have to work towards solutions to, to plan a successful future and then execute, execute those plans, all those studies, to make our goals a reality. We truly have people all over the world cheering us on. Um, we look forward to continuing all of this work together from the city team to city council to our partners throughout the city, uh, our public and the parents of our school children. And I'll, I'll end with Ted Lasso, the immortal, now immortal Ted Lasso. If you just figure out some way to turn that me into us, the sky's the limit for you. If we work together as one Scranton, we can become that destination city, the city that attracts a new generation, brings back the kids who grew up here. We have to plan for success and we have to work together. And perhaps most of all, we have to believe that we deserve the best city possible. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you to make that happen uh, and appreciate all of your time and for coming today. Thanks everyone for your presentations. And this recording will be available um, in a few hours, I would think on uh, ECTV's YouTube channel and we'll link it to our website and also to all of our social media platforms. So thank you everyone. really appreciate your time and attention.